Welcome to today's textile talk. Um, I'm Nancy Bavor and I'm the director at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. And I'm really excited today to introduce one of our current exhibiting artists, uh, Corinne Okada Takara, as today's Textile Talk speaker. Textile Talks, as you know, if you've been here before, is a weekly virtual lecture series presented by six different fiber art organizations each Wednesday. Uh, Studio Art Quilt Associates, the International Quilt Museum, Surface Design Association, Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, and the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. Today's presentation and question and answer session will last about an hour. And so that we can continue to offer these talks for free, I hope you'll consider making a donation or becoming a member of our museum or support whatever group is presenting that week. And we'll put a link in the chat shortly, or you can visit the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles website. Um, during today's presentation, use the Q&A button for your questions, um, the chat box for greeting others, and post event survey for commentary and constructive feedback. And if you prefer not to see the notifications from the chat, you can always click on the chat button to toggle them off or on. And we respectfully ask that you be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants. We want to thank our 2021 and 22 Textile Talk sponsors who do make this series free and accessible to audience worldwide. Our sponsors include at the platinum level, Moda Fabrics and Supplies and Quilting Daily. And at the silver level, Orafil and eQuilter.com. And at the bronze level, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spools Seminar, Misty Fuse, Attached Ink, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, Thai Silks, and The Quilt Show. And I hope you'll patronize these sponsors. For those of you who live near San Jose, California, this is a reminder that this is the last weekend to see our museum's current exhibitions that include American Tapestry Biennial 13, solo shows by former Textile Talk speakers, Kira Dominguez Holtgren and Ryan Carrington. We also have on view Stars and Stories, American Art from the Permanent Collection and an exhibition with our current artist in residence and today's speaker, Corinne Okada Takara. We look forward to opening our brand new fall exhibitions that include Studio Art Quilt Associates traveling exhibition, Layered and Stitch, 50 Years of Innovative Art, which traces the history of the art quilt movement for the last 50 years, and More Impact, Climate Change with Tapestry Weavers West. They will be open on September 22nd and 23rd for our members only, and then they will be open to the public during our regularly scheduled hours starting Friday, September 14th. And to learn more about these exhibitions and upcoming events and classes, please visit our website at sjquiltmuseum.org. Now, I'm really delighted to introduce today's speaker. Um, she's a gifted artist, educator, and a longtime friend of the museum, Corinne Okada Takara. Corinne is the summer 2021 artist in residence at SJMQT. And since June, she served as the lead artist in a series of community workshops that are really intended to drive questions surrounding art, biotechnology, and sustainable design. And these ex exciting experimental workshops are part of the artist's larger BioQuilts project, which is a community sourced art program that explores the artistic and technological possibilities of biomaterials, of which we will hear more about today. And when I first learned about Corinne's BioQuilts project, I was absolutely fascinated by her reference to kombucha leather and seaweed bioplastics. And it's been a personal professional pleasure to learn more about biomaterials from her. Corinne regularly conducts workshops on sustainability and biomaterial design that celebrate existing cultural and community knowledge. She's a board member of the Salinas California Community Biolab, Shinampa, and is on the arts advisory panel of the Alliance for Youth Achievement in East San Jose, California. She's won many local and national awards for innovative community STEAM programs and is a 2020 National Public Interest Technology Community Innovation Special Fellow. That's quite a mouthful, representing Shinampa. So she's, she's a busy, busy artist. Corinne develops uh, programming out of her garage maker space and is co-founder of BioJam, which is a teen camp 
of the Stanford University Bioengineering Department. So we're thrilled to work with this talented multidisciplinary artist and to debut her exhibition of community made bio quilts at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. And we're so excited to have you here today, Corinne. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Nancy, for that beautiful introduction. Um, I have been sitting here waiting for the garbage truck to go by. So luckily it's gone by and um, we we'll able to hear all of that. Uh, greetings from Cupertino, California. I'm in my garage makerspace, and I'm really excited to share with you uh, my journey and my thoughts on uh, how might we engage broader communities in biomaterial design conversations, sustainability design, how do we grow communities through art? And that's a question I've been asking through all of my art practice for the past, um, I don't know, five years or so. Um, Nancy mentioned kombucha leather. The image in the background here is a sample of that. And what we're going to talk about today is how do we create new community spaces that intersect and create communion among scientists, biologists, artists, and create space for local community knowledge to come to the forefront in conversations about innovation design, both in sustainability design, but also in conversations about the future of biotech. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to share a little bit about myself. Um, I, there's two things that inform my lens and how I approach both my art practice and my instructional practice as an artist, a biomaterial artist. And one is that I'm the daughter of a toy designer. And I grew up in a household where all exploration was play and fun. And I bring that lens to all my workshops. I want exploration and thoughts about science and biology to anchor from a place of creativity. The second thing that really informs my approach, and I saw that we had some people from Hawaii here, I am uh, one generation removed from life on the plantation in Maui. My father is from, um, had his early childhood years in Pa'ia, Maui, and then grew up in Kahului. But I really learned from him and my grandmother, and my relatives about the, the high level of value placed on reuse of materials, growing your own materials, and the creativity and creative repurposing that went on in plantation culture. And I know that is a cultural perspective and lens that's in every agricultural plantation environment around the world. So I, was, I feel very privileged to have had that in my upbringing, and I can bring some of that to the programming that I do this idea of creative thriftiness and pride. And next, I wanna um, find out a little bit about you. And this is an experiment. Um, in the chat, I, I imagine that we are gonna be putting in um, the link for the mural board. Um, actually, I can just stick it in. Um, and this is, I'm gonna stop sharing and go to this other screen to share with you um, where you can um, share your thoughts um, and where you're from. So I'm gonna share screen again. I saw someone said, I'm from Chicago. Some people are in the link. So we're gonna be using this throughout the presentation. I'll be using it. I'll be answering questions on here later as well. Think of this as a giant dry erase board that doesn't go away and that you can zoom in. So how you navigate this, as you can see in my screen, there is a, um, a view pane in the bottom right. Think of this as a map and you can zoom in on it. So I'm gonna zoom in it now. And I'm going to go over, I'm going to pan over to the left. Um, and that is where I want you to add a little bit about yourself. So on the very far left, and you can zoom in very close to these, um, is a little bit about myself. If you click on these little tiny icons, it'll take you to different web links. Here are my Instagram and Twitter accounts. But what I would love, and I see some people are doing this, oh, the garbage truck is back. <laughs> is for you to select a post-it note. And once you select it, you can double click on it and just start typing. So I'd love for you to zoom in, zoom in onto this panel and add your name, where you're from and what your art focus is. Uh, if you wanna drag over your own post-it note, there's a post-it note icon on the far left. And I understand this may work great for some of you. And for some of you, this is just like way too confusing. Um, but hopefully you have a mouse that you can pan with and you can go into the introduce yourself section. And again, you zoom in and zoom out in the bottom right hand corner. 
Um, I also have, oh yay, I see it just a swarm as you can see on my screen. Uh, it's like a confetti of names coming into sharing who you are and where you're from. So that's fantastic. I also want to just quickly highlight if you ever want to contact me, uh, my contact information is in the bottom left here. Um, wonderful. So now I'm going to stop screen and go back to my presentation while you are adding um, uh, your contact information. So let me switch to my other pane and I'm going to share again. So thank you for, for um, sharing. Um, I just really like using Miraboard. I've been teaching in COVID for the last year, and it's been really wonderful to have a space where we can kind of have a residue of thought that we can come back to. So this presentation, what are we going to cover? I'm going to talk about what is bio design. Um, there are many different perspectives on that, but I'm going to frame it as to how I view bio design. Um, again, on the mirror board, there's a spot for you to share what you think is bio design, and you can add that as we go. I'm going to talk about what is bio quilts in this journey that I've been on with the quilt museum and a range of community organizations in San Jose, from um, Japantown, Little Saigon, and the Mayfair community in downtown. And then I'm going to talk about materials and processes, and then opportunities um, moving forward, and then questions. Excuse me. <coughs> So what is biodesign? In my view, biodesign is storytelling and it's slow making with nature. So biology is slow, it's on a different time frame. And so how do we journey along with biology and communion and with communion with each other uh, in this slow process? And how do we design with and for of, of biology? And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a moment about designing with biology. Um, but go ahead and feel free to add your thoughts. On the right-hand side, I have a time-lapse of some biology growing, um, and it is mycelium, which is a root-like structure of filamentous fungus, basically the roots of mushrooms, that is growing in a feedstock that is locally sourced. So that crane is growing in waste stream, stream ramen, and coffee grounds, uh, and bar bark. And then it's been kind of filmed over a period of maybe five or six days. So that's what that image of, is of. Um, just a brief history on biodesign. I was talking with Nancy and some others before we came online on how recent this is, but also how very ancient. So once we start talking about designing and growing with biology, we cannot um, ignore the vast knowledge and our ancestral knowledge in many, many cultures across the globe, in our own ancestral um, communities. And we need to bring those into the science conversations in ways that they are not present now. Uh, so biodesign is both new and ancient. And we have always shaped the growth of other organisms and their byproducts. And I've listed a few examples here. Uh, but the idea of controlled cellular growth um, at the cellular and genetic level is only part of the conversation within the past several decades. And so why, why BioQuilt? We really want to elevate diverse community uh, conversation, community voices, and the storytelling, and the material explorations, and the questions that are going to drive the future of sustainability design. And having worked with and working with bioengineers uh, from community labs uh, across the globe and bioengineers at Stanford, I just see that who own, drives the questions owns a conversation. And so how can we bring in underrepresentative, traditionally excluded communities into the conversation of where biodesign and biotech need to go? That is a really big part of this conversation. What really drove this project to look for accessible ways, kitchen science ways to bring biomaking in a creative way to different community spaces. So I'm going to start off with showing you some of the outcome, and then we'll go into the process. So just to show you a few of the quilts results of our project, this is one of the quilts that was designed uh, in Little Saigon in collaboration with Chopsticks Alley. We met in the Little Saigon uh, Vietnamese Heritage Garden. All of our workshops happened in uh, outdoor community spaces because we did buy our quilts during COVID. Um, so it's really interesting to kind of explore how do we create these new intersectional spaces among different 
community members, both multi-generational and from um, different academic disciplines and just from the community. So this was done, this was done in collaboration with uh, Vietnamese elders uh, that were gardening in, the, in that park area. I'll talk about the materials more in, the, in a little bit. Uh, there are also links in the mural board um, to the actual um, fuller descriptions of these. And here is um, the quilt result from the one that we did in Japantown. And this was in collaboration with the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. We created these in their parking lot um, over two workshops. And our main substrate was mycelium from the reishi mushroom grown in waste stream ramen and rice. And the rice was suggested from the previous quilt, um, uh, bio quilt um, uh, very first workshop in Little Saigon. So in a way there was conversation among these community spaces. And again, I'm gonna go over the process in just a little bit. I just wanna show you some of the final outcome of what we were headed towards. I wanted to have outcome that could be put together in a quilt-like representation, but then each element can be taken off of the quilt and returned to the community member who created it so that the conversation about my biomaterials extended into their home spaces. So often when we talk about science and design and, and biology, we have in our minds um, certain academic spaces that these conversations happen in. How can we push those understandings of where is appropriate and where do we experiment and where do we commune for these conversations uh, was something I really wanted to explore. How can we have these conversations in gardens and in parking lots? And how can we take the artifacts of these conversations and bring them into home spaces where that conversation can expand outward more? Um, in this piece here, um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but there's also a few that have seeds embedded in them. Uh, and those seeds are from the community spaces that, that we met in. So now I'm going to get into process. So um, just to explain some of this, we grew the mycelium roots, root-like structure uh, fungus. That was our base structure of our quilt squares. We grew them in mold forms uh, that either I designed or community artists designed. And we fed them locally sourced feedstock. So at middle screen, those jars have pressure cooked cactus, waste stream rice, coffee grounds, garden waste, and a range of other materials that participants suggested that we use um, as feedstock to put into mold forms with the mycelium. So step one, uh, we think of this almost like, and I think this is from little Saigon from Chopstick Alley. Trammy Crom told me that some of the participants said it was so fun because it felt like it was making mud pies. <laughs> so it doesn't feel highly technical. Uh, the conversations were around science, but it was so, a sensory. It was very hands-on. So the participants stuffed mold forms, uh, and I'll talk about how those mold forms are made. And then those were incubated and grew over two weeks. And then we returned back to these community spaces with those bio-grown, the mycelium, the roots of like structure of the fungus had grown into the substrate they were fed. And then we baked them to make them inert. So they couldn't grow anymore. They were just inert and still and no longer living. And in the second workshop, the participants decorated what they had created in the first workshop. So part of the challenge of biology is the length of time to grow, but it also created opportunity to revisit spaces. And that's really important to have repeat visits in community spaces that um, often are underserved. It's, um, it's, it's, it's nice not to have just one in, fly in, do a workshop and leave, but have uh, continual presence. And this image, I'm not gonna dwell too long on, because um, I want to make sure we have time uh, for other things, but it's also on the mural board. This is how I envisioned the flow of this whole journey with communities. Again, we work with three different community spaces. We had two visits or three visits per site. And the first workshop was really getting ideas on forms that represented their community, so sketches, um, and then also what substrates they might want to use. Uh, and they stuffed their mold forms that were designed by a local artist and in local substrate that was already sourced from there. And then it grew and we came back for the second workshop. And right now we're in step four where we're having an exhibition at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. And then uh, after the 12th, the different quilt pieces will move into the community spaces. Uh, and then at the end, we're gonna have a bio recipe book. And there's actually a web page um, with some, some of these resources already on the bio quilts uh, website.
So what can we grow with? I've been showing you some image of biomaterials, haven't really talked about them yet, but I'm gonna start talking now about some model organisms we can work with, things that are um, food grade sustainable, uh, food grade safe, BSL level one biology safe, they're known organisms that don't harm. Um, and so the first one um, I already touched upon, which is mycelium. And I've been working on with mycelium since 2017, um, very much thanks to the mentorship of, of um, Anya Schultz at the Tech Interactive in the Biotinkering Studio uh, and the generosity of Microworks, which is a company in Emeryville, California, that is exploring growing mycelium leather. And they have provided me with the base mycelium stock that we've used and incubated in other materials. But these are just some of the examples of growing uh, mycelium in the geometries that you, you wish. Um, and the, the right hand one is a, a face mask that I created um, and it was in the London Design Biennial this last year. We can also grow on bacterial cellulose and Nancy mentioned that earlier. So from the kombucha drinks that may be available in stores in your area, um, that drink that is a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast grows a film on top. And that film is cellulose and the bacteria in that culture creates that raft. Um, the culture is both aerobic and anaerobic. Some of the organisms in that culture don't want any oxygen and some do. And so that, that raft kind of creates a seal and enables the ones that want oxygen uh, to have access to it. Um, and so these are some examples um, of growing bacterial cellulose in petri dishes. And the other images are of teens of, that I work with and what they imagine in their creative playful uses of using this cellulose that is harvested from the culture, dried, and then it can be laser cut or colored um, and made into different things. Chitin is another material we can work with. Chitin is the second most populous biomass on earth uh, by weight after cellulose. And chitin is found in the exoskeletons of crustaceans and shrimps. And it's also found in the outer layer of the hypha, of the root-like structure of mycelium. It's actually the reason fungus is, is in its own kingdom because it has chitin, which is also found in insects and crustaceans. So this biomaterial can be blended with different, uh, with vinegar and glycerin um, to create a bioplastic. And we use these in our projects. Um, with my uh, the BioQuilts project. Oops. We can also explore with seaweed and algae. Uh, many people who come into biology and start plating petri dishes, that's their first experience with agar agar or agar. Uh, my first experience is with what you see in the left, and that is making Japanese desserts like kantan and yokan. Um, and so I use the food material instead of the, the uh, scientific grade auger, I get it from the Japanese grocery store. And that's what we use to create algae string in the BioQuilts project. And people squeeze these out of Ziploc baggies, like frosting, as you can see in the middle image, we let them dry. And they came back to the second workshop with these to decorate their BioQuilts. So now I'm just going to speak a little bit about the mold forms we use for BioQuilts, really trying to draw from community as much as possible specifically the three communities that we work with for BioQuilt. So Adi Miyako from Japantown um, created this really beautiful crane design that we used. And then Cynthia Cow created the lotus flower in the middle for Little Saigon. She's also a member of Chopstick Alley. And then Patty Botello, an amazing Kenyatta artist, uh, created the Nopales cactus um, design. So taking these sketches, I created mold forms. Uh, I created illustrator files and laser cut the cranes to create big mold forms. I did the same with the lotus flower. And then these were dipped in hot wax to create waterproof, sprayable. We wanted to sterilize these before we filled our mold forms. Um, and that was one of the type of molds we did. The one on the far right actually should be in my next slide. It is vacuum formed. And that was uh, Patty Botello's uh, cactus. So we had two types of mold forms. And here's a little bit about that process for the, the cactus one. Um, and I'm just gonna show the images because I know I'm getting um, a little late in my time here, but her sketch went into Tinkercad where I created a 3D print and then vacuum formed. And then people were able to, again, put their bioculture growths into these mold forms. So to hear some images from the actual workshops, workshop one, stuffing the mold forms, 
Uh, we're wearing gloves uh, to protect the cultures, not ourselves. The feedstock that we gave the mycelium is really yummy for many other organisms, you know, other mold, I mean, molds and other things. So we just really want to protect it and make sure that only what we wanted to grow, just the mushroom roots. And I keep saying roots are not roots, they're root-like structures that the root-like structures would really grow through this um, and, and replace the feedstock with its own network of, of fibers. Also in the first workshop, we created algae string. I just mentioned what that is. You can see in the far left here, the little Ziploc baggie. And that was sodium alginate that was squeezed and with a mixture of other ingredients that was squeezed into a calcium chloride bath where the reaction happened to polymerize it to turn it into a, uh, you know, like a, a bioplastic um, that you could use and manipulate uh, after it dried. And here are some images of workshop two, where we came back with the bio-grown materials that have been baked and made inert. And then the participants were able to uh, decorate it how they chose. Each group did a different decorating method um, and the first one we had markers and Lawan brought back the algae string and just really made really colorful uh, bioforms of their quilts that grew into the mesh. In Japantown we had a lot more quilters so there was a lot more sewing involved um, on those forms and in the the um, vegulution workshop on the far right we used spray chalk uh, to color and they also decorated with um, a range of bioplastics um, to, to bring their, their nopales mycelium um, to life. And this is really interesting because the form echoes what's in the feedstock because the feedstock also was cactus. So kind of meta there. Um, and then the next slide is in each group, we asked, what would you like um, to explore? What would you put into a feedstock if you could kind of start exploring other things? And you can see there's lots of interesting um, thoughts here um, in terms of what else we might add into um, our substrates as we grow these biomaterials. And so I'm really interested in knowing what you may grow, what you will design, um, and just really interested in all of us carrying this conversation into our community. So I'm going to stop sharing screen. And thank you all so much for your time. And I want to give space for question and answer and for me to also look at the mural board and what's been shared there. So I'm going to stop now. Um, and um, just thank you all so, so very much. So thank you, Corinne. That was fascinating. Even though I participated in one of the workshops, um, it still is a mystery how, how you make this happen. Do you want to, to go to the Miro, Miro board for, first and see what questions, or shall I? Is that okay? Can I do it? go to the Miro board? Okay, so I'm gonna share screen because I'm gonna check on it now. Um, I'm really excited to see like lots of things floating around. Um, so, um, let me look at what is biodesign to you first. I'm just curious, there's some, yeah, upcycling, that's great. So yes, that is definitely how we can look at um, what is biodesign. Um, let me get a little closer to this one. Um, oh, yeah, sun dyeing, rust dyeing, very cool. Different dyeing techniques slow stitching. Yeah, I think the whole metaphor of quilts really ties in well to existing textile practices. It all takes time. And sewers and quilters already know that. Um, so local substrates you might use. Yeah, local plants to create dyes and making supplies. Let me expand this window out a little bit more so I can see. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and then, yep, yeah, kombucha, algae, gelatins. Um, I got a really funny comment from someone in Little Saigon, like, what's a cultural material that you could use? And this one guy being very, very uh, humorous said, cigarette butts. <laughs> but I thought that was a really great comment. You know, he was joking because he was alluding to it was a cultural thing, but, you know, so many uh, Asian cultures smoke a lot. But that's a huge waste stream material. Um, face masks are the new butt, cigarette butts in our lived environment now. But how can these be used? Actually, those can be feedstock for mycelium and for some of the other organisms we can work with. Can, um, can you repeat that? You can take the, the filter material from cigarette butts and, and do what? Yeah, um, so mycelium, I didn't go deep into this, but it can eat so many things. It's like the, it's our planet's ultimate biodigester. So it can digest plastics, 
there, there's research on this. Um, it can um, break down ligand cellulose, which other things cannot. It actually exudes an enzyme that's kind of like Lysol. Um, it, it, it is being looked at by NASA. There's a NASA Ames team that is called Microarchitecture. And they're looking at using the, the potential of using mycelium as insulation in off-planet habitation and feeding it human waste and using it in an insulation of habitation because it lives on anything, like almost anything. It, it's amazing at extracting the nutrients it needs. Um, and it can certain my, uh, filamentous fungus, certain mushrooms can repel stellar and sol solar radiation. It is, it is kind of like the magic material. Um, it is uh, impact oh. resistant as a building material. It's fire retardant. There's so much. I could I could do a whole like two hours on fungus, but anyway. I thought I thought nothing destroyed cigarette butts. I thought they were in the environment forever. So okay, clearly we need to all start collecting cigarette butts and making mycelium cranes. <laughs> <laughs> and and mealworms and um, waxworms also can digest um, uh, polystyrene, which until 2015 no one knew could be decomposed naturally. Wow. So they have a gut bacteria that can break down polystyrene. And so there's research groups now looking at that. But the fact that we don't know this in common vocabulary indicates there's an opportunity space to bring science innovation, early science research into broader community conversations. Fabulous. I remember you're mentioning something in the workshop about um, in the manufacture of kombucha and the, the making of it that there was often a film created uh, as you're making it that they just simply lift off and throw away, but that could be used for kombucha leather. Exactly. Do I have that right? <laughs> That's, correct. That's correct. So if you think of, um, well, I guess we have industrial scale uh, kombucha now, companies growing kombucha, you're going to get that scooby or scoby, however you say it, that bacteria cellulose growing on the top, no matter what. They Many of them throw that away, but what if we brought that into um, a different, you know, from the waste stream into our built environments and our textile environments? Um, some places where that can happen, some conversation spaces I want to highlight super fast and resources is Materion. This is a recipe site. If you click on that little arrow, some of these images I have on this page, they take either hot links to um, different panels, um, and that's a recipe site. Um, but yeah, Nature's Recipe Book. Um, but anyway, I'm going to stop sharing so you can ask your questions, Nancy. But uh, thank you for adding thoughts to the mirror board. Um, you know, there were there were quite a few questions about um, your just your materials. And the first one was, you know, working with some of these organisms, uh, mold spores, are there any cautions with handling? I saw some people had gloves. I assume that was just for hygiene more than anything. Such a good question. So there's another doc we could throw into that mirror board, but I, I try to run off of the SL1 level protocols. And that really is, um, you know, you really do want to have your hair tied back. Like you want to wear gloves. Um, it, it, the gloves are really to protect the organism. But if you are in a lab setting in a lab, um, you want to, um, you know, reduce any organism exchange if possible. Um, Luckily, we were in COVID anyway, so we're wearing masks, but there's no spore. So people always ask that about the mushrooms. When you're working with the mycelium, the root-like structure, there are no spores because the spore is only in the fruiting body, which is the mushroom. Now, if you are growing it, so after, mm -hmm. I didn't explain, but during the time between the workshops, one, workshop one and workshop two, I took all the designs home um, in little Ziploc bags, a little gap for breathing. Um, and then they grew in that time. You wanna have them in a safe space where nothing's gonna grow. It is possible, and it has happened to me where mold will grow in it. That's not the mushroom, it's black or it turns green. And what I do in that case is I spray it with hydrogen peroxide. Um, it won't just damage the mycelium, but it'll kill the, the, the spores of the mold. Um, so yes, that's always a, you know, you were, we're talking about biology here. And so, you know, start with known organisms, start with food grade organisms um, and just try to keep it as simple as possible. But in the outdoor setting, it was really hard, <laughs> but we, we kind of lucked out. Yeah. Um, and also, um, again, I was interested in, in kind of the texture of the materials. And there was a question about like with the mycelium, you know, how hard are they? 
what does the kombucha leather feel like? Um, what do some of the, like the string, it was soft in creation, but then I know it was still pliable, but firm. Yeah. yeah. Um, those are great questions because again, um, materials change over time and especially with biomaterials. And um, this is uh, bacterial cellulose. This is grown from the kombucha. It's very, very leather-like. Um, and I grew it between, I pressed it when I dried it between um, sink racks from Daiso, Japanese store, and then um, just put bricks on it so that it, it was embedded with that texture. Um, so it's very leather-like, but if I only grew it for, I just grew it for many weeks. If I had a weaker culture and only grew it for a few weeks, it might be like tissue paper. And some of our workshops, we did have um, the kombucha leather that wasn't grown as long, and it was really more like working with tissue paper. Um, this is, I don't know if you can hear this, this is bioplastic from um, agar agar, and it's really much more like plastic. It really is very plasticky um, and durable well, until you get water on it. Um, so that's that one. Um, mycelium, it depends on how you grow it. So there's a whole journey you can have with growing under compression. If you grow it under compression, it's going to be stronger and how long you grow it. Or if you spray it, you can have it skin up. So there's so many different morphologies that are dependent upon um, environmental factors. Um, this is a kind of prototype by a student I had last spring who was envisioning a knee brace for ag workers in the strawberry field. And his next step would be to create joints where this would be flexible, but this is really hard and, and uh, you know, a solid structure. Um, so the mycelium is a really interesting conversation because it can have many morphologies. And again, if you're only collecting the very top skin, if you're just growing the mycelium pure, and you don't have any substrate inside, it actually becomes like a leather. Um, and, and somebody asked about the, the leather and the, the bioplastic and it's, could it be sewn um, onto a quilt? And I said, yes, it could be. A, from ex personal experience, um, you can stitch through it. It's, um, it is like sewing through plastic in that it, it can tear or you can, you can crack it if it's really dry, but if it's still a little pliable, it's quite easy to do step stitch through. Does it get to a point where it's so stiff though that it, it does break if you try and stitch it? Um, not for the, my, so I'm gonna actually show an image, um, not for uh, the kombucha leather. Um, so here's an example of growing kombucha leather. It's in from my, I have two mother jars that are like this big and I just, it's just a culture I keep feeding. So it always will be able, I'll be able to skin off the top. So this top, this, this cellulose here is from that mother culture. When I harvested, it was this thick. And then when the water came out, it became like this. Um, it's very durable. A lot of what the explorations are now is doing multi-materials. What else can you add to is to add structure. Um, there was someone at UC Davis whose thesis, graduate thesis project was a Wonder Woman costume made out of kombucha leather. And I think she added many materials to that. Um, um, yeah, but there is, if you grow it too thin, it's very, very tissuey. The nice thing is you can rehydrate and stack them. So you could have a lot of very thin little dials that you've grown in petri dishes and they might rip. I'm like, okay, I'll re-wet them all on a, on a clay, a uh, piece of wood, stack them together. And now I have this really cool, thicker material that's stronger. And you can just, and you can also sandwich things inside of them. What, what happens when they get wet? Um, it depends. So when they get wet, um, they, um, they don't dissolve. So I did a, a test with teens a couple of years ago they want to see what happened if you wore it and you sweat it, you sweat in it. And so they did petri dish, petri dish tests with the bacterial cellulose in a simulation of human sweat. They did a calculation of salt to water. It was a very simple calculation, very simple mock sweat. Um, and we left it in there for months because we had to shut down the very next day for COVID closure. This is like March 2020. Um, and then I was only able to get back in the lab. Um, oh gosh. I don't know, it was maybe five months later and they didn't dissolve, just the sweat congealed on it. So nothing happened. Although people say like water impacts it, I'm sure over time it degrades, color changes. So that's for me, the biggest degradation. You can have a really bright color and then often that color will fade. Um, but yeah, that sweat test was kind of interesting. Um, somebody else made a comment about the slide you show of silkworms. What, what did you do with those? Yes, yeah, so, um, uh, 
silkworms, I, those are like, I do work with silkworms as bio collaborators. So let me see if I can find an image of that. Um, so in collaboration with silkworms, I, I make little baskets, I just give kids laser cut strips of cardboard and they use silk thread to create a basket. And then you put in mulberry leaves and then you let the silkworms grow and you keep feeding them. Like they eat madly. You feed them, they fall out of the basket, you put them in and then they oh. grow their cocoon in the basket. And along the way they've created connecting threads and when they merge as moss, I return the moss to a nature center but then I light up exactly where they have the cocoon. And so it's a collaboration to create a light structure. So that okay. could work well. Fascinating. And one more material question. Are there um, mycelium varieties that have special properties like bioluminescence or color like other mushrooms, other you know, cool properties? Yeah, that's a great question. So that leads into like what's for the future. Um, yeah, so a lot that's happening in like very simple biomaterial exploration is taking bioluminescence from a certain jellyfish and inserting that DNA into other organisms. Um, and then there's a really cool project called um, BioArtBot where you can um, design an art pattern and have that injected into little petri dish wells, a 96 well plate to create art and it glows. Um, and I'm actually gonna put that in the chat because it's such a wonderful project um, that came out of CCL uh, and uh, counterculture labs in Oakland. Um, and it's exactly in that conversation sphere that um, your, the question came from. So there was quite a lot of a buzz about, um, somebody said, oh, the little kids I volunteer with would love this, making those projects. And then, oh yes, let's have a community service project for collecting cigarette butts and PPEs and making <laughs> So, <laughs> so, so the ability to eat the PPE is like and the cigarette butts. It's so I think that's only like lab experiments. I've actually tried to take um, the face mask and grow it in my son. I myself have not had success. So I think it's a really cool conversation to how you make small little tests and how do you share that knowledge across spaces? How do you create um, methods and means to find out the best way to grow? Um, and the reason I say that I've, I've worked with mealworms because mealworms can eat plastics, but um, they grow, they eat it best when they also have some brand meal in with them. So it's not just giving them that material. It's like, what is the best, what are the other variables that enhance their ability? And how do you keep it, how do you keep it not getting too warm? Because then they'll transform into beetles, darkling beetles, and they don't eat as voraciously as they did as mealworms. Like grape nuts on your ice cream. There you go. Um, <laughs> Because I work in a museum, um, of course, the question about conservation always comes up. One of the artists made a comment that she uses fish scales in her art quilting and she rubs them with lotion, wondering how long they're going to last. Um, do you have a sense for how long these materials will last? That's question number one. And what might be their potential for attracting pests? That's a great question. Um, uh... There, I made a mycelium light. Um, well, you can see one right behind me, but I made a chandelier. Move my chair. Uh, mycelium, oops, other way. <laughs> I made a mycelium chandelier for the Technicum in 2017. I'm wondering how that's lasting. I haven't been doing this long enough to know. Um, but in terms of preservation, I think it's really important to look at um, ancient no ancestral knowledges. I know that, um, you know, in the, the plains, indigenous people of the United States, they would use the brains of some of their. Um, kills to do the curing and uh, you know, adding that fat layer to whatever they, they had um, preserved. Um, you really have to preserve things, um, dry things out first. You have to make sure that whatever you've grown, that you've made inert. Because if it's a little bit damp, it might start growing things again. Um, but again, like where, where are these spaces we can have these conversations? Where is this being data collected? Like I think these are great questions coming from artists that you wouldn't get from scientists. Like where is that intersection space that we can create? I think it's, it's really needed to develop these questions and results that people are sharing. And again, like someone mentioned youth, like youth can be a part of this um, yeah. testing and experimenting, yeah. And, and for people who want to try this at home, <laughs> um, you know, where do they get the materials? I know you said you just your kombucha at the grocery store, get plain, not the flavored. Um, and you know, are your recipes and instructions on your website? Great question. So um, I do have recipes on, um, I'm starting to populate them on the BioQuilt site on the re uh, recipe page. Um, but I'm also, I'm going to share with you, highlight on the, um, 
on the mural board. Um, if you go to resources, um, I have two team teams here that, so I do all my exploration in, co in collaboration with community and youth. This youth team has recipes on their site and I'm gonna embed their kombucha recipe um, onto um, into my bio um, quilt site. So there's a recipe page on the bio quilt site. Um, something that might be of interest to those of you who wanna start growing with mycelium, and just like you know, getting substrate that's ready to start and ready to go, I would go to Grow Bio, and it's also here on this resource page. And I'm just going to click on it really quickly so you can see. Um, this is from Ecovative. It's a spinoff company of Ecovative. Um, if you click on the shop section, you can buy a bag of the substrates, and you can even buy mold forms. Um, and you would buy the, the materials here is what you would you would get and you could um, grow it yourself <laughs> and start trying it out and growing it in, in, in your own materials. Uh, but I, to answer your question, Nancy, long story short, yes, the, the recipe page of BioQuilt is going to have it. Um, I have recipes all over the place, the bio, uh, the bio jam team, um, I have recipes there. So I'm going to try to collate it all into the recipe page of BioQuilt. Great. Great. Yeah, and maybe we can get that um, website, the Grow Bio, in the chat so people can do that. Um, so, you know, one last question: what's what's ahead for you? What's what's next? <laughs> um, continuing bio making. I'm gonna put that in the chat so people can see where you can order that. Um, just continuing these conversations and trying to explore new spaces. So I'm working now with the community bio lab in Chinampa uh, in Salinas called Chinampa. We just got our space op opened up. It's a new uh, bio community space and we wanna see what we can create. It's in the old Salinas firehouse. Um, that's on the short horizon. Uh, also on the short horizon, we're moving back to Hawaii. So um, how might uh, I engage with um, community and family there? I'm really interested. Um, in working possibly with Kupu, which is a really wonderful organization on, in um, Oahu, um, with land-based learning. So how do we create these intersectional spaces with art and land-based learning is what I'm interested in, and just also sustaining uh, BioJam Camp. Um, Great. Well, thank you so much. This has been absolutely fascinating, kind of mind expanding. <laughs> and, you know, I think maybe five years from now, we're going to see some bio quilts at Quilt National or some other uh, artists using the biomaterials and and remember you saw it here first um we're going to miss you when you move corinne of course but um thank you so much for sharing all about BioQuilt's project today and just a reminder for those of you in the bay area this is your last weekend to see corinne's work in per person so some of the works that she showed are on exhibition um in our artist in residence gallery space as well as some of those um, that she created from the, the camps, the summer workshops that she did. And they're really, they're really quite surprising. Um, so that is up until Sunday, September 20th until three o'clock. And we'll also put Corinne's website and social media info in the chat. So be sure and follow her online. And I again want to thank our sponsors for supporting this event. We'll be sharing a presentation, um, this year, presentation on YouTube and Facebook afterwards. And again, if you enjoyed the, the talk and you'd like to donate or become a museum member, just go to our website, sjquiltmuseum.org and join us next Wednesday for our presentation with the Modern Quilt Guild. And we look forward to seeing you then. So take care and stay safe. Thanks for coming.